Again, I'd like to express our heartfelt appreciation for the hospitality, the kindness, may I say grace, that you folks exhibit. And we have very much enjoyed our stay here and the opportunity to, to see like-minded believers who are ongoing and making a difference for the cause of Christ. It's just, it's just a joy. Amen. Those of you, seriously, that were not here yesterday, I was better yesterday than I'm going to be today. <laughs> and you missed three other way better messages. So that's the beauty of the website and digital and electronics. Yes. Catch up so that we're all on the same page because that was excellent material yesterday and I wouldn't have you to miss any of it. Please turn to 1 Corinthians. You already know that I'm going to be talking about the offense of the cross. And a good text as the jumping off point for that is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where we read in the 22nd verse that the Jews require a sign. That would be a wrong thing. In this dispensation, we needn't have signs and wonders. There is no standing for Israel. I know there's about 12 million people who call themselves the Hebrew people populating the planet today, about half of them in Israel and half of them spread around the globe, but they're not the Israel of God. John Hagee's wrong. All 12 million of them have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So you think God's going to give them the kingdom? I don't. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. That's also wrong. The wisdom of the Greeks, Aristotle and all of the founding philosophers of Greek philosophy, you say, oh, we get democracy from there, but you live in a republic. <laughs> Seeking after human wisdom is not where we go either. The next word, the disjunction, disjunctive conjunction but so Jews requiring a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom don't think that oh, I need to be a wise person that's not what this is about here comes the but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block unto the Greeks foolishness so everybody's in trouble Christ crucified We've made that so simple and so clear in the four preceding messages. It's difficult to miss that we're the sinner, we have nothing to offer. God manifest in the flesh, took our place on Calvary's cross, died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day with victory. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, as we're reading in chapter two, in verse two, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He wasn't showing up at a new assembly and asking if you have heated water in the baptistry. No. He wasn't showing up at a new assembly and asking if you had a five-piece rock band to entertain the folks during the services. That's right. He cared only to know Christ and him crucified. He presents with crystal clarity in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses that I use to sign every email I ever send out. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, verse 2, by which also you're saved. That's what we're looking for, the saving gospel. Verse 3, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. I don't see my name in it, except the sin part there in the third verse that I needed payment for. It's a marvelous verse in Ephesians chapter four, in verse 32, where Paul concludes that chapter by saying, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Now here's what I'm after. Even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. I don't know what offends you. We're talking about the offense of the cross. I'm offended when I hear people say, 
Oh, for Christ's sake, cut it out. They use that as a cuss word. When for Christ's sake, I have forgiveness. Amen. I have total liberty and free. I'm complete in Christ. Yeah. I don't have to climb a ladder to get there. I need not join a lodge and climb the 33 degrees and get myself a funny hat. I am already complete. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. As a matter of fact, you can't even see me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, my life's hid in his. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it's not me that's here. I'm here as his ambassador and he tells me that's who I am and that I've been crucified with him. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, we noted last time and again today, imputation is the concept here that's important for us to get our heads around. I don't bring anything to the transaction except a sin debt and that sinfulness that I've accomplished has been imputed to my Savior. His righteousness, which I certainly don't deserve, has been imputed to my account. And that's the transaction that you read about in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 in verse 21. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. I know sin. I was born to it. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells me that by one man sin entered and death by sin. And now death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all, that's even me. I like to think that I'm upstanding and have integrity. And I'm a garden variety sinner. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Thanks be unto God for his unsearchable riches having been revealed through the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8. So I know that I am complete in Christ. I would not have known in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. No. Romans in chapter 3 Paul says in, in verse 26. It's Christ's righteousness. To declare I say at this time his righteousness. That he, that's Christ, might be the just and the justifier. You couldn't fit me in there with a crowbar and a sledgehammer. Christ is the just and the justifier. Yeah. I've not accomplished, I'd be wrong if I thought that I could accomplish anything to make myself worthy. He did it all and I'm accepting what he did and so I'm justified by faith. Faith, by the way, I keep hearing people say, particularly politicians in the last how long was this election? 100 years? <laughs> I keep hearing them say, well, he's a person of faith, and she's a... Faith in what? Yes. Faith has an object. Yes. The object of my faith is the God of the Bible, the Christ of the Bible, the Spirit of the Bible, the Gospel of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. My faith has an object. My eyes don't glaze over and I don't stare at the ceiling and go, oh, bless you. It's not that kind of thing with me. It's a doctrinal fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. It's a doctrinal fact that he died and he expiated my sins. He paid a price that I couldn't pay. And I am so grateful. Amen. Thankful for what he did. Justified by faith. We have peace with God. Wow. We have, that's what it says, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. We have peace with God. So, if I walk out the building today and my Lincoln has four flat tires, that's not God chastising me for preaching a bad message. One of you did that. <laughs> that's just bad tires. <laughs> I'm at peace with God. Yes. I should choose to do all that I do for his glory. I should reckon myself, Romans chapter 6, verses 10, 11, and 12, dead on the sin. There's some things that I should do. 
as we answered a question yesterday about works and God in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 hath foreordained work good works that we should walk in them. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 I should walk in newness of life when I don't shame on me but my sins have been paid for I'm starting a fire at the judgment seat of Christ for my wood, hay, and stubble. I choose not to do that. So I'm at peace. Isn't all that wonderful? Please turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want us to focus on a verse. This verse, by God's grace, and it's his verse, I've used quite a few times in helping people see the issues associated with a soul being saved. One dear brother, his last name only has one consonant in it. He's from Nigeria and that's how their names are. A UQ. There's a K toward the end. He was struggling because back there in Nigeria, what they call Christianity is a whole lot like what I call voodoo and witchcraft. And so, thanks to listening to me on the broadcast and different things on the website and coming to our assembly and different things, he made a profession of salvation. I'm thinking to myself, don't talk to him about it until the occasion is appropriate, I'm worried about this guy because I've given him the right information but it's floating in this sea of junk that he picked up back at home in Nigeria. So as we were leaving the building one day, we're walking out together and I said, Linus, look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. And we're walking down the steps and we're out into the parking lot. He got his Bible open and we're looking and, and the verse says, In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you, uh, also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I said, Linus, let's start at the back of that verse and work our way forwards. You see the last thing that happens in the verse? You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now we know from other places that you're sealed into the day of redemption, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. You see what preceded, what happened before you were sealed? You believed. What'd you believe? Now that's what I was really worried about with this fellow. Because I didn't know he was throwing apparitions in, he was throwing self-flagellation in, whipping themselves. All kinds of weird things are out there, folks. Nigerians have other problems other than sending you emails telling you you won $5 million. <laughs> so this fellow, he, he said, oh, okay, I believe. Believe what? What's precedent in the verse? The gospel of your salvation. Linus, I said to him, what is the gospel of your salvation? He said to me, Christ died for my sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. Amen. That was a pretty good answer. Yes. I said, where'd you get that? Look at the verse. You got it from the word of truth. You didn't get it from me. You didn't read it on the back of the cereal box. You got it from the word of truth. God's word. In whom you also trusted. You trusted what you heard in God's word. You believed it the gospel of your salvation, and God's Spirit seals you. That, I said to him, and I say to you now, gives you everything you need to know. Yeah. There's not a drop of water baptism in it. No. There's not one commandment to be kept in it. This is a wonderful way to present Christ's cross his death, burial, and resurrection, his gospel, and show the elements, show the things involved when a soul is saved. Now, here's the problem. That verse, which you and I now know frontwards and backwards, that verse 
It's one of more than 31,000 verses in this book. So people get confused. There's so much material. Didn't Jeremy draw an excellent chart? Yes. Yeah. Those of you that weren't here yesterday, consider yourself picked on, you missed it. <laughs> but he started his chart, this is eternity past, and this is a lot of things happening before the foundation of the world in these Bible verses. And he started his chart with grapes. I think that Adam and Eve partook of grapes. Everybody says an apple. If I could find in the Bible what trees were in the garden, that would help me then narrow it down, would it not? And if there wasn't an apple tree, really, where are the trees that's in the garden? Judges 9. Yes. Now that's called truth from a remoter context. I've got truth about the garden explained in Judges chapter 9. By the way, what fruit could people not eat if they were Nazarites? The forbidden fruit. What typifies the blood? I'm pretty sure it was a grape they ate. You make up your own mind. You can be wrong if you want. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so they get expelled from the garden. And because sin waxed worse and worse continually, God floods out the whole shooting match. Now, I love again what uh, Brother Jeremy did yesterday when he... Uh, didn't show lovely little pictures of the animals getting on two by two because of course they didn't. Clean animals got on 14 each. But he had dead bodies floating in the water. Yes. You never see the flood pictured as Bad thing. a horrible event. Yeah. But you've got churches in, well there's no town here. <laughs> Close proximity. You've got churches in the state of Indiana someplace <laughs> that actually will go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and use what Peter says about Noah and how eight were saved by water. And they'll take that to say, see, water baptism doth now save us. But the eight people who were saved by water were dry. Yes. The water baptized people drowned like rats. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Millions of them. Yes. Truth from a remoter context. By the way, as good as his chart was yesterday, there was a time when Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the four ladies disembarked they were not on dry ground. They were not in the ark. That's the plank dispensation. <laughs> I could lead you folks anyway. <laughs> that was just being silly. Is he serious? I think he's serious, Molly. <laughs> We're Justin, get this guy. <laughs> we know nations came into existence because after Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth came off the ark, Noah's drunk right away. Problems ensue. Man's consciences wax worse and worse continually. They were sinful all the day long. And Back here with some hidden information about God's going to set up a heavenly program. These guys are going to do it on their own. And they're going to build the rock album of the 80s, Stairway to Heaven. Yeah. Mm. So God shuts that down. And by the conflation, the confusion of languages, you have nations begin. Now, all the Germanic nations, 
They're issued brass instruments and they march. <laughs> the French, they like Jerry Lewis movies. So birds of a feather flock together and you have nations and God looks at the whole sea of them and says, ah, none of them is worthy. So God begins a new nation with a fellow I found out yesterday, I thought his name was Abram, and I thought his name got changed to Abraham. Really, it's just Abe. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that yesterday. And, and oh, Abe, oh, heads up to Abe. Abe gets talked to about some specific things and a covenant in Genesis 12. That covenant, Abe just gets it. But there's another covenant that God makes with Abe in Genesis chapter 17. Abe's got to do some stuff to get that. Yes. And then, if that weren't enough, there's more in Genesis chapter 22. Abe's got to do some stuff to get that. So when Paul, Romans 4, talks about Abe, He's talking about Abe in one construct. And when James talks about Abe, and that's perfectly appropriate to use one man to teach two things because two things are going on with him. Yes. That's a hard concept, isn't it? More than one thing going on in the Bible. <laughs> Woo! We know that this is important selfishly because with Abe you have the middle wall of partition. You have circumcision being put in place by which then you have a whole different group of people identified in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse 12. Without hope, without covenant, without promise, without anything. They're called Gentiles. God's dealing with these people, Israel, that come from Abraham's loins. These people are intended to be attracted to that and then become part of the circumcision. We're separate and apart down here. Now, if that weren't enough, Look at all God's done with these people. And they're still messing up. So the first page of the Old Testament in your Bible is in the 69th chapter in your Bible. Yeah. Exodus chapter 19, where God gives the Old Testament. And the Old Testament given to that nation Israel Maybe the biggest lie ever told in the history of humanity is in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, when Israel says, Oh, yeah, we'll do that. Amen. All oh, these we'll do that. Yeah, really? You're not going to make it a page. And you're not doing it. So, the law is given. Interesting thing about the law truth from a remoter context. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says that Jesus was born of a virgin and made under the law. Jesus shows up as a Sabbath observing, pork abstaining Hebrew. And he came not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which you know from Matthew chapter 10 verses 5 and 6, and you see it exemplified in Matthew chapter 15. How are we doing so far? So here comes Christ, the Messiah, and he is under the law. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, on the other side of Calvary's cross, are by definition Old Testament in their doctrine. I know that. Here's how. I can read this book. Yes. And this book... I don't need to interpret it. This book says without the death of the testator, there is no testament. That's right. So, 
can't be a New Testament till the death of the testator. That means 27 chapters of Matthew are Old Testament in their doctrine. Our Father, Matthew 18, the church dispute procedure, so many things that are inculcated into church life in America are actually ministered to Old Testament Israel about their kingdom. 23 chapters of Luke, 15 and a half chapters of Mark, 17 plus chapters of John. If you took those chapters away from the pulpits of America, people would be standing there going, huh? What am I going to preach if I don't have the Beatitudes? Wow. And same as so many of us. I was seated there thinking, red letters, that's more important than the rest. It's in red. Jesus, he's more important than anybody else. That'd be true. I didn't know that the Lord Jesus Christ came to the Apostle Paul and gave Paul a revelation of the mystery which is aimed directly at me and you in this dispensation. I thought it was all big one thing. So it took time. I believe this, and you believe what you want to. As I pointed out earlier, you can be wrong if you want to. <laughs> I believe everybody in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who agreed that Christ was the Messiah and testified to that. How do you testify to Jesus being the Messiah? In Luke 7, you get baptized. What was the function of John's baptism? He declares it in John chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. It's to make known to Israel Christ being the Messiah. That's right. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. The publicans and the lawyers, they rejected the counsel of God in Luke chapter 7. They wouldn't get baptized. I believe the water baptized people in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who had John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, received him. The promise to them is to many as receive him would give power to become the sons of God. They're the ones that get the Holy Ghost in Acts 2. Yeah. That's what I believe. Amen. Other folks say, look what happened to that crowd. All those people that follow the Messiah, look at them. They're talking in tongues. They're healing. They're, they're, look at them. I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to get baptized. That's Acts 2.38. Yeah. Change of mind, that's what repent means. Yeah. Water baptism. So, when the Holy Spirit comes and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which churches all over America claim that they're doing, I'm going to say to you, when that dove descended, he descended on people who had received the Messiah. They were getting the promise. The very promise you read in Luke 24. If I could remove the book of John and just have you turn from Luke 24 to the next page that Luke wrote, it would be Acts 1. Yes. Now, I know the Lord Jesus Christ, he after his death, burial, and resurrection, he after he is ready to return for Israel, but they are uncircumcised in heart and ears according to Acts chapter 7, verse 51. He comes to his primary opponent, a man who was complicit in killing Peter and his guys. He's going after him. If anybody in the Bible was all set to be the Antichrist yeah. in Acts 7, Acts 8, it would be Saul of Tarsus. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Find me somebody that fits better. Yeah. But talk about grace. Christ comes to him and gives him that which had been known in ages past but kept a secret 
And it is now made manifest to this new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17, the body of Christ. Nobody back here thought, I'm the body of Christ. No, they thought they were like every Pentecostal. I'm a king's kid. He's not my king, I'm not his subject. He's my head, I'm his body. Amen. Words mean things. Yes. Those are different things. Well, we've got then a situation where, of course, in due time, the body of Christ is going to get out of Dodge. We're going to meet the Lord in heavenly places. And this prophetic program, which has been going on, plays out in what is commonly referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble of the great tribulation and subsequent to that there'll be the kingdom that comes to this earth for Israel I forget how he drew it yesterday but I'll just draw this looks like the Lord needs an ottoman when I get done but that's his throne there <laughs> looks okay. like an ottoman would help wouldn't it? Or that's the first floor <laughs> but after the time of Jacob's trouble that kingdom which had been promised and prophesied it was at hand in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John but it wasn't offered No. it couldn't be offered in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John without the death of their Passover lamb without their quintessential sacrifice with blood better than the blood of bulls and goats. That's what the book of Hebrews explains to the Hebrew people about what's happened. Yes. Even Israel doesn't understand everything that took place on Calvary's cross for their benefit until they read the Hebrew epistles. That's, it. That's why they're called the Hebrew epistles. By the way, don't they sort it out in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7, 8, and 9 that Peter, James, and John are going to go to the circumcision. Paul and Barnabas are going to go to the uncircumcision. Who wrote these little books out here after Paul's writings? Peter, James, and John. What a coincidence. <laughs> Those are called Hebrew epistles. Hmm. I know. You love 1 John. Because 1 John has the word love in it over 30 times. It's warm, it's fuzzy. And you know, because you keep the commandments, right? That's in 1 John twice. You know, because you love the brethren, and you're not that fond of me right now. <laughs> So you're in danger. Shape up. Get warmer and fuzzy. <laughs> this is as warm and fuzzy as I get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you better write that down. <laughs> and how do you spell inappropriate? In <laughs> A-P-P-R-O-P-I-A-T-E. Amen. Inappropriate. Amen. Ten thirty-two. It's going to be a long car ride home. How simple it is when we look at First Corinthians fifteen one to four. How simple it is when we look at Ephesians chapter one and verse thirteen. How simple it is. And then you put that which is the simplicity which is in Christ Jesus. You put that which, care to know nothing of you, save Christ and him crucified, in this tremendous book that chronicles all human history from one eternity to the other. And folks get overwhelmed. Now, I know from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, who's the God of this world? Oh, how I love Jesus. No, the God of this world 
is trying to hide the gospel. The God of this world is the devil. I know that from here, and I also know it from Ephesians chapter 2. He's, he's got a course that the world follows. A rut that leads to hell. It's amazing to me. Every generation has symbols of rebellion. Mine, it was, <laughs> you're not going to, long hair. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work out well for me. <laughs> But all of us rebels did exactly the same thing. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> kind of like today. You can spot them at 100 yards because they all look the same. Mm -hmm. Their pants are down to their, and their underwear sticking out, and they got, they got the Declaration of Independence up one arm and Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible tattooed up the other one, and we're just going to fight it out. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. They all fall into the same trap. Because the course of this world doesn't go but one place. That's it. So the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not. Blinded. I think of blinded, I think of darkness. But no. You see, what's happening is the light of the glorious gospel has to be dealt with. Obfuscated is the word that Jeremy used yesterday. Best way to do that when you're the angel of light because that's who you've transformed yourself into is I'm a light over here, Jehovah Witnesses. I'm a light over here, Catholics. I'm a light over here. You don't need any of that. I'm a light over here. We're freedom from religion. I'm a light over here. I'm a... And all these different lights well, they're all equal. We need to coexist. You've all seen the bumper sticker? Yeah. We need to coexist. You'll coexist for eternity in a place called the lake of fire. Yeah. Amen. Without Christ, there's no hope. Now, in this, the dispensation of God's grace, if we could again turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, This is going to be hard for me. Justin told me I only get three hours. <laughs> and I'm going to have to really go fast. See, Paul's my pattern. He preached, he preached so long, people were falling asleep, dropping out of windows and dying. I've done a lot of stuff over the last 30 or so years, but I haven't had that happen yet. Today may be the day. I've had quite a few fall asleep. <laughs> But in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, notice the new creature, of course, in verse 17. All things are of God, that's wonderful. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. So it's by Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. Preaching of the cross, which is to them which perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. It's that which performs the reconciliation. Now, the fact that reconciliation is available, who's it available to? All the belief. That's not universalism. That's not Ali Ali oxen free, everybody comes in free. Reconciliation is available. I have it on my account by Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, trusting the gospel to my salvation. We okay? Be careful that you don't flip that reconciliation coin over and say, not only is everybody reconciled, but nobody's going to go to hell either. The reason why you need to rethink that one, you might find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
Because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, those that have not received the truth, God sends a strong delusion that they would believe a lie, function, be damned. You want to take those kinds of chances? I don't. And be careful you're not building a system like Calvin did that doesn't even need a cross. Yes. If you're predestined, all this is just marker board illustration, Golgotha. Hmm? Yeah. So be careful. I know some things, and we talked about them yesterday. I have to bring some of you up to speed. Yesterday we talked about Pelagianism which is named after a guy that lived in the 5th century, died in the 5th century, was uh, active in the, in the 4th century, named Pelagius. And his idea was, there's no sin curse on us. God does not see us in the first Adam. He does not see us in his cursed creation. 2 Corinthians I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, belies that. In Adam all die. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, death passed upon all, belies that. And the fact that God's going to send them a strong delusion that they'd be damned, belies that. So it's important, I think, that we, we think these things through. Be careful. Pelagius had the idea that since nobody has original sin, since God's creation is intended to glorify Him, we must then take these people and do pragmatic, practical things to get them to where they're glorifying God. Now, the fellow that used this in the 1830s and his name, Charles Grandison Finney, I can't teach all of what we went over yesterday, he invented this business of the invitation system, calling people forward, asking Jesus into their hearts, and now I'm going to live for Jesus. It was all about manipulating crowds and then teaching them so that you are making them better and making them better and encouraging them to be better. Another fellow took the same approach of pragmatism and he was the founder of our public education's philosophy and his name was John Dewey. Now, again, I don't want to belabor these points, but it's important, I think, for us to notice if we think everybody's reconciled, that's universalism. Well, you've got to believe the gospel. What about those that don't? Well, there's no hell. What happened to the in Adam all die. Yeah. She's warned over Pelagianism. Yeah. 1600 years later, we're still talking about the same things. Yeah. If there's people who can sin and instead of going to hell, they go to Cleveland or limbo or soul sleep, what have we done? We've made the cross of Christ of none effect. That's it. You see the problem? Let me attempt to illustrate it for you. Once upon a time, there were people who, before they'd eaten the grape, they hadn't sinned. And later on in 1 John, there's people who don't sin. So, I'm not going to sin. So I trust Christ plus I'm trusting being sinless. And we take truth from a remoter context and we misapply it. Now that's the Wesleyan Holiness denomination by which you are largely surrounded in this part of the world. I'm not mad at the soul. You folks look a little tense. <laughs> God creates that special nation for him called Israel. How many people think that they are 
physical Israel living in America because we all know the tribes got scattered and they went to northern Europe. Why? The tribe of Dan? Scandinavia. Denmark. You laugh, folks. That's real in the worldwide church of God. And those folks ended up in England, came on a boat, came over here. That's why God blesses America because we are the lost tribes. Worldwide Church of God got a whole lot more money and a whole lot more people than we do. They've taken truth from a remoter context and they have, I'm a spiritual Jew. They think they're a physical Jew. They have applied it and added it to Calvary's cross. Now, most everybody in any of the so-called mainstream denominations, evangelicalism, they think that they are in some sense a replacement Israel. Israel fell, we're here. We'll do it. And so they are attempting to operate under Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're attempting to act, oh, they love the book of Acts. Except for verse 46 and 47 where you have to sell all your stuff. They're not good about that. No. Have you noticed these repent and be baptized people and these hostile to Shandai people? They got the plasma TVs. They're supposed to sell all that they have and part it out equally. When you get done parting out, you just come on to my house. I'll see what you got. Yeah. <laughs> We're tearing up the carpet now. We're going to need new furniture. Bring it on, folks. You axe two folks. How many people have you talked to over the years that said, well, I'm keeping the commandments as best I can? Yeah. Well, I believe you have to believe in Jesus, but oh, if you break the commandments, you lose it. They're keeping the law. Yeah. Insidious. Insidious. And oh my people, how we hurt ourselves. You know what his most important thing that he needs to do is? Read. Yeah. We need to know stuff. Yes. I bored you yesterday. I'm doing it again today. Talking about Pelagius and Pelagianism talking to you about Charles Grandison Finney in 1830 in a Presbyterian church in Rochester, New York. He comes over to Ohio. He's president of Oberlin College. He's tremendously influential in this idea of we don't have original sin. We just got to make them live better. And the best selling fiction Christian title ever in all human history is called In His Steps. And in his steps written by Charles Sheldon is Pelagianism, yeah. is pragmatism, and it was Charles Grandison Finney that got the idea to Sheldon. Huh. Wow. And we are the first to say, well, if you don't know the lessons of history, you're going to repeat the errors of history. Mm -hmm. We need to know our own history. Amen. Because it ain't pretty. We need to shake it off. And how many people have the idea that they're following in his steps? Uh, Brother Justin mentioned yesterday about a fellow, you've apparently got one around here, who probably in the spring gets himself a big old cross and got little wheels on the back. I think that's cheating. He's got little yes. wheels on the back. And it was Arthur Blissett that walked all the way across America yeah. with a cross on his back. Another Southern Baptist fellow. in his steps. To think that you could follow in his steps, apparently you don't know he was God manifest in the flesh. Or you're a megalomaniac. Yes. Which means you ought to run for office. <laughs> Amen. Now another thing that I can find in the pages of scripture is being sorry that Jesus died. The point that Brother Justin brought out yesterday. Oh, oh, I love Jesus and they killed him. 
So I need to suffer like my Savior suffered. There are people who vote and drive cars, <laughs> who put ashes on their forehead, mm -hmm. who bow to statues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a guy in the Bible who makes a statue. He worships what he made with his own hands. It falls down and goes boom. He puts it back together again. Lots of people think that suffering will make them more godly. Can you find a time when Paul fasts to get closer to the Lord? Paul mentions fasting in the same place he mentions being threatened by robbers, perils of countrymen, perils, 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 perils. People think, well, if I do my penance, go to church and confess to Father Jack. You know Father Jack, he's in the confessional box. Jack in the box. <laughs> Closer to home. Luke 18. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I pray the sinner's prayer in Luke 18. When the prayer was offered, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, would that mercy be based on the death, burial, and resurrection? No. no. It would be based on having a right relationship with God during the prophetic program under the law with your Messiah. So people pray the prayer, and you know what they're trusting? I know I'm hard. I know I'm being rude. I've worked at this a long time. I've got that down. <laughs> it just happen, huh? They trust their prayer. Yeah. Yeah. I went forward. I prayed. I asked Jesus into my heart. I made Jesus Lord of my life. A lot of folks who have never heard that Christ died for their sins with the clarity that it needs to be presented, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, will tell you, I talk in tongues. When you talk with folks about their glossiania, here's something you might not have noticed. They get way more offended than you expected. Yes. That's their proof that they're saved. You think you're talking about sign gifts. They think they're talking about whether they're saved or not because that's their ID card. Yeah, it's their sign. Commonly, from Acts chapter 2, we hear, I repented. And you follow that quickly with, I got baptized. Now, if you're Church of Christ, it's not baptized. It's baptized. Listen to them on the radio. It said, 100%. You need to come to our church and get baptized. The jump helps. We've got... It's so insidious. Did Christ do everything or not? Yes. Were we reconciled as an entity by imputation? the whole world 2,000 years ago, and we access that by grace through faith in the gospel? Yes. Then, oh boy. I'm going to do it, sweetie. Don't be mad at me. Then don't think you have to confess with your mouth. Amen. That's all over the grace movement in certain places. Romans 10, 9, and 10. You have to confess with your mouth. That same grace preacher will tell you, well, Paul in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is talking to Israel about Israel. And Yeah, but you're going to take those two verses and you're going to require your people to say something. I confessed with my mouth. What words did you use? Maybe they weren't the right words. 
Every time God speaks in the Bible, it's in Hebrew. Did you talk to him in Hebrew? If you confess with your mouth loud, does that mean you lack faith? I'm being hard. And I mean to be. Because what we're doing is we're covering up the cross yeah. with stuff that we find in the Bible and we throw it at the cross and hope it sticks. What we've done is we've made the cross of Christ of none effect. That's it. What about these poor people out here in Matthew chapter 24, which is the tribulation? I endure to the end. Which is what many of you will say in about four minutes when I'm done. <laughs> we did it. I endured to the end. <laughs> Glory. Is he going back to Ohio? Remind me to go to Illinois. <laughs> and then, of course, in 1 John, there's loving the brethren. And there's keeping commandments. Uh, one of my all-time favorites comes from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I open my heart's door. <laughs> your heart doesn't have a door God, articles ventricles veins chambers doesn't have a door and if you did open a door that would be something you did that's right now I need to rush toward the conclusion in Isaiah we're talking about the offense of the cross and now we're going to attempt to define it. In Isaiah chapter 14. I need those two more hours. In Isaiah chapter 14, the devil lays out his plan. And in Isaiah chapter 14 in verse 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? If your Bible doesn't say Lucifer, you don't have a King James Bible because only the King James Bible has Lucifer in it. Only the King James Bible has Calvary in it. So when we sing by Calvary and you don't have a King James Bible, you need to sing by mm -mm -mm because Calvary's not in your Bible. Years I spent in vanity and pride caring at oh, by mm -mm -mm. Okay, so we'll be able to spot the NIV people by their <laughs> I can make more people mad in one message than anybody you ever met. Amen. When are you going to offend me? I'm working on it. <laughs> in Isaiah chapter 14, look at what he says. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north sides of the north, that's up where Santa Claus is. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Do you see? I try to emphasize. I, 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 I. What have I got up here? I open my heart's doors. I'm enduring. I confess. I got baptized. I repented. I talk in tongues. I prayed. I'm doing penance. I'm following this. That's the offense. Yes. Amen. That's the problem. We want to be involved. Yeah. We want it to be about us. The famous book, Purpose Driven Church, the first sentence in it is, this is not about you, but the whole rest of the book is. Yes. <laughs> I'm keeping the law. I'm a replacement Israel. I'm spiritual Israel. I love the brethren and keep the command. I'm going to live a sinless life. I, 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 me, I'm worthy. I made Jesus Lord of my life. Until I made him Lord of my life, he was in charge of the porta potty. But I made him. <laughs> you didn't do anything for him. He did for you what you needed done. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? So, it's offensive when you're trying to make a name for yourself. It's offensive when you're trying to be a celebrity. It's offensive when church growth is more important than getting people saved. It's offensive if you want to become wealthy in this religion business to preach Christ and Him crucified. No works, no performance, 
Tear up your tithe check because it's an offense in the nostrils of God. Should I now say have a nice day and go sit down? Okay. You just got another one. <laughs> Should we take that cross and make it more palatable? Should we be concerned that God's plan of salvation is offensive to sinful humanity? I don't think so. I think it's our job to endure hardness as a good soldier, to preach Christ in Him crucified. And I'm not going to be ignorant of Satan's devices. I'm going to learn how the devil uses truth from a remoter context to destroy the cross. Yeah. I'm going to learn how to use truth from a remoter context to understand the cross. I'm going to take the time to learn where these, where the invitation system come from. It's not in my Bible. No, no. How'd that come to me? Why? What's the why behind it? And and I, it's boring reading about Pelagianism, reading about Pelagius, who cares? Except his teaching gets picked up in 1830, which gets picked up by Billy Graham, which gets yeah. picked up by Charles Sheldon, which gets picked up in every church in America that has an every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around. If you'd like to go to heaven, raise your hand. If you'd like to go to heaven, raise a foot. If you'd like to go to heaven, raise, you. raise your other foot. <laughs> You've been slain in the spirit, brother. You raised both feet and fell on the floor. I hope, by God's mercy and grace, and by your not walking out of the meeting, <laughs> that I've been able to illustrate for you the offense of the cross is because we've been left out of the plan of salvation. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit satisfied the Godhead with the death, burial, and resurrection of God manifest in the flesh. And that offer of reconciliation is there. If I reject it, John 3, 18, everybody memorizes 16, what about 18? I'm condemned already. Having rejected Calvary's cross, and seeing what else is out there, you can make a lot of religious choices that will take you to hell quicker than the Greyhound bus. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You here are a beacon of right division, and everybody can see it because there isn't a building tall anywhere. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you.